it's time for the infamous brew day. Um, so everybody's been asking for a shot of the system and the brew day. So about three o'clock right now. Today's a Monday. I had to come in after their service for today uh, because I was up in Dallas for a Christmas party on Sunday. So I couldn't brew then. So I am brewing today, which is a late start, but we'll see if we can get this knocked out and not be here too late. But yeah, this is just gonna be the overview of how I brew on this system. And uh, today we're brewing 13 degrees Mave. We need to catch up because we are running out. So yeah, let's get started. All right, we got our trusty pickle bucket here. Decided to bring us out here to this old scale. So this is like an antique scale for, I'm not exactly sure what they used to use it for, but this is pretty dope. So I'm going to uh, need 19 pounds of Caramunic type one and 16 pounds of Carafa special two in this recipe. And then it's 165 pounds of Vireman pills, which is, they come in 55 pound bags. So it's three bags of that. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and set this to 16 pounds so I can get my Carafa Special 2 weight up. Pretty close to what I need, but I'm gonna go grab a scooper to take off however many pounds I need. All right, so that looks good on the Carafa Special 3. Let's move on to the Caramunic Type 2, or I'm sorry, Crap a special two and care munich type one. I just dumped that into another bag that I will use for milling, and then I'm going to weigh out care munich type one. All right, looks like that was a little shy, so I will have to open my other bag. Ugh. These bags have a, a pretty interesting braided rope that keeps the bag shut, and it takes quite a bit of dexterity to, and, and just a thousand times trying to get that down, but basically you pull it right and it comes out. So now I will use my handy dandy measuring tool that fell on the ground again to weigh the last few pounds. So this Cara Munich type one is a caramel malt. So it builds a lot of, uh, Nice caramelized sugar character adds to the uh, sweetness in the body of the beer. And then Carafa Special 2 is a uh, roasted malt, obviously, as I just said. And special means that it's dehusked, which removes the husk uh, after it's been roasted. So that doesn't contribute any more bitterness to it than it already will. That's what grain looks like. All right, so the microphone wasn't turned on at this point, but this is me describing how my mill setup works. This is a basic homebrew mill system with the drill attached to it where it turns rollers and it crushes the grain. Crushed grain falls into this trash can. Uh, this is also the debut of me without my head in the video, which you'll see a lot more of because my camera placement is terrible. Bear with me, I'm trying to get used to angles and all of that, but yeah, most of the video is me headless. All right, so before I forget, I am uh, running water through my filter and filling up my kettle for the uh, strike volume. So I'm gonna fill up a, I think a barrel and a half or two barrels, I can't remember. Uh, it's, I, it's hard to access the recipe while I'm filming. So I will double check that and fill it adequately. I have a rag over that faucet because it sprays water everywhere. So just so you know, but yeah, so I'll be filling this up. Be turning the burners on and uh, letting this heat up to the appropriate temperature before we begin mashing in. It is milled. Been nice and good. Now we have our uh, hot water, or I'm sorry, a hot liquor. I'm gonna recirculate this water so that we have an accurate temperature. I'm 
hook up this pump via these hoses to the bottom of this tank and just recirculate it back on top so that we have a good um, mixing evenly and heating up evenly. my valve for my hot liquor tank or oil kettle really crack that so that water starts flowing through because it's not a self-priming pump you have to get water flowing through the pump housing so that when you turn it on it doesn't just cavitate yeah. all right so now we're rolling good i'm uh recirculating from the bottom of this tank into the pump out up and then it's just creating a little whirlpool in there so that we can have or even um, heating up of the hot liquor as it reaches the final few degrees. Right now we're looking at 162, 163, and we're gonna shoot for 170-ish. One, Ugh, I hate holding that up there. All right, so now that that is recirculating, I'm gonna give it, it's probably gonna take another five, 10 minutes to get up the temperature and then we will get everything set up for the mash, including our salts, which I'll show you right now. So we're brewing the 13 degree tamave today, which is a dark lager, dark beer. The roasted malts in the dark beer are acidic and adjust the pH of the mash down lower. So we need to compensate for that by adding some baking soda. Normally on a pale lager, like the 12 degree or 10 degree, we'll add some calcium chloride or gypsum or both to acidify the mash because that's a very basic grain bill. So what I've got over here is 12 grams of baking soda staged up so that we have pH adjustment for this dark lager mash. All right, I've grabbed my trusty mash paddle, got my grain bins pulled over here. I'm gonna dunk this in my mash tun and pull up a step ladder so that I can mash in. This pail that I used to uh, mill in with to introduce the grain as I'm mashing also as I'm doing this, it's occurring to me that this is all very, very, very basic, very homebrewy type ways of brewing shit. Beer, sorry, YouTube. Um, but it works and there's nothing fancy here. Um, so I just wanna have the viewers keep that in mind. So I checked the temperature of our uh, strike temp or of our strike water and it's a little bit warmer than the thermometer was reading. So I used a, a digital thermometer just to Again, always check yourself. It's about two degrees higher than I was uh, anticipating, so it's about ready to introduce the first layer of water into the mash tun, so that we're gonna bring the hot water above the grate so that the grain has something to land on and it's not just gonna be dry on the grates. And then I, uh, yeah, and then I will just proceed mashing in. Hopefully I'll get a better camera angle over here, but let me go ahead and switch this up now. All right, we're gonna toss our baking soda in. That's gonna get hydrated and be nice and ready for the mash. That's good enough angle. All right, here comes the So I just forgot that I left the uh, microphone attached to the side of this uh, where I was mashing in at. So this is the mash. It's looking good. Uh, the camera cut out before I uh, got done mashing in. So sorry about that. But the mash went well, uh, went pretty smoothly. And now it's going to rest for about 20 minutes before I pull off a portion to do a simple decoction. Oh, it's dark in here, so probably not great for YouTubing. This is the part where I'm going to take a quick little break and sit down and then regroup and do the partial decoction, and I'll show you all that, and then we'll you know, continue the brewing process. I'll probably fill up the, uh, the kettle again to start heating up strike water, or strike water, heating up sparge water, and then we'll be back at it. Went ahead and scooped some of the mash out into this big pot. I'm gonna 
turn on these burners on the stovetop. Uh, so this is where I'm going to do my partial decoction at. Uh, again, this is not a decoction in the sense that we're looking for any step mashing or um, any conversion whatsoever. We're just boiling, basically impart tannins into the wort because that's one of the side effects of decoction. It's a flavor contributor as well as caramelize some of the sugar so we get some of that Maillard reaction. And yeah, this is mostly just for flavor. So we're going to do that and uh, boil for about 20 minutes and then uh, reintroduce it into the mash. Here's the boiled wort and grain mixture from the decoction back into the mash done. I've hooked up the hose for the inlet of the pump onto the bottom of the mash tun and the outlet is draped over the side of the mash tun so that we can perform recirculation. This is a technique called borlofing. What it does is it, it recirculates the wort through the grain bed and it clarifies it and helps homogenize everything and uh, have, have a nice even temperature spread across the whole mash bed. So what we're gonna do is turn on the pump. I'm gonna open this up just a little bit and I'm gonna wait for the flow to hit a decent pace. Now that we have a good steady stream, steady flow, I'm gonna turn that down to a much lower flow rate. Also looks very light in color. I'm not liking that. I don't know. That work looks uh, a little lighter in color than I was expecting. So maybe it just needs time to get completely mixed up in there, but I would I would expect it to be a little bit darker than that, so that's a surprise, but we'll kind of see how it goes. As soon as this is done recirculating for another 20, 30 minutes, we're going to then start moving it into the brew kettle again, and that's where we will uh, begin this farge. We will take a first wort sample from there and take a gravity reading and a pH reading, and that'll give us some more insight into how our extraction was and, and what the uh, color of the word is. So we'll be back when that happens. Ready. So I'm taking this hose now that our recirculation is done and to uh, comment on the, the comment that I made earlier about it looking light in color, uh, I was correct. I think it was just the first bit of water in the bottom of the mash gun that had not been fully um, mixed in with the rest of the work. And so it was a little bit lighter in color, but now it's looking pretty dark and roasty and beautiful. So I'm just kind of rinsing off the, this end of the hose because it's got a bunch of grain stuck to it. And I'm going to attach it to my brew kettle. Crack this open. And I'm going to turn on the pump. And I want this flow rate to be pretty even and steady. Totally forgot. I need to take a sample. And that was very messy and not at all how I envisioned it going. Yeah. That's okay. You're not perfect here at the Tanglefoot. Nice. Look at that. Nice and dark. Let's set that over here to cool and resume the sparge. Resume the pumping from the bottom of the mash gun into the brew kettle. And I mentioned earlier that I was going to uh, have hot water in the uh, hot liquor tank and sparge with that, but I forgot that I am uh, trying a new technique where I'm using the hot water from the water heater, running it through the filter, and then just sparging with that. So it's a pretty, it's, it's, I think it's sitting at like 160 or 170, so pretty good temperature for sparging. So I'm gonna try that and then uh, see how that works. This setup is not the fanciest of sparging techniques, but it'll do. So what I'm doing now is I'm watching the grain bed. I guess I should take my earbuds out. I'm watching the grain bed. And uh, what I want is I wanna keep about an inch of water above that grain bed. So uh, kind of the, the tricky part of this is that, and this comes with brewing experience, but 
this particular this grain bed in particular i was mentioning earlier these dark beers are like my favorites to brew because they're so buoyant and nice and loose and they just feel great and smell great but with that comes this kind of false buoyancy of how much liquid is in here with the grain so i can put you know i can i can stick to that one inch rule but in reality it's going to be more buoyant and stratified than it would be if it was all pilsner malt and what that means is that there's more liquid in there um, than there would be. There's more liquid in there with that one inch buffer that I'm talking about than would be in another less buoyant mash. And so I'm kind of kind of shooting in between those two uh, those two kind of different different types of mashes where I want to keep that layer of water on top, but I also don't want to flood this with too much water that it dilutes all of the work in there and I'm extracting less sugar. It's uh, anyways, I feel like I'm not making a lot of sense, but I'm going to play this by ear and just kind of eyeball it like that to me is an adequate amount of water for this particular mash. Um, and then we'll just keep the pump speed keeping up with the flow rate of this sparge water. So we just extracted a bunch of sugar from that grain. We converted it during the mash step and now we want to move all of that wort into our brew kettle and this hot water will hopefully rinse as much sugar out of it as we can and then collect all the wort in the brew kettle. So I'm going to continue doing this. This is going to take a while and then I'm going to, once this is at a, a stasis, like a good um, kind of flow rate between the two, and I'm gonna go ahead and start working on the fermentation vessel and get that sanitized. So now we need to make up some sanitizer solution. Sandy clean. Gaskets. Teas. Valves. Side glass. Sample port. And all those nice and gaskets. I also need this racking arm. So sanitizing all of these in preparation for sanitizing this fermentation vessel. All right, now that this sample has had time to cool down a little bit, we're gonna collect a little bit in our dropper and then place it onto a clean, dry refractometer. Close that up and give it a look-see. All right, that's looking like 17.2-ish. Let me check with my actual eye. Yep, that's about right. So seems a little slightly tiny bit lower than I was expecting. I was expecting like maybe 19 uh, degrees Play-Doh, but we'll uh, check kettle full gravity and then adjust if we need to, increase the boil time or whatever if we didn't get quite the efficiency we were expecting, but we are continuing to sparge and it looks like we need to increase our uh, sparge speed slightly. I increased the uh, the pump speed just a bit to catch up because it was filling up too much, but just uh, now we just adjust and wait for that to fill up. All right, next step is pH. I turn this on, open that with one hand, give it a dunk. We're gonna watch this. We're looking at it hitting about 2.5, I'm sorry, 5.2. And uh, yeah, we'll just let this calibrate or equilibrate and come back and see, oh shit. <laughs> just come back and see what it lands on. All right, so it's kind of petering out at 5.15-ish and it's dropping 1.01 like that every few minutes. So if it just, it, it doesn't stabilize, uh, we're going to call it 5.15. Well, there you go. It keeps going. So 5.13, 5.1-ish, but not too far off. Um, if we were to adjust it for the next brew, maybe increase some of that baking soda to make the solution a little bit more alkaline, but overall pretty decent mash and readings from gravity and pH as it continues to drop. So now that I've got this guy, those dead spots, those are sanitized. I've got all of my parts soaking and sanitized, so I'm going to go ahead and build this tank up. And I forgot that 
the sample cock that was supposed to go on here is uh, the gasket on it broke, snapped the other day. So I don't have a sample port for this tank. So I'm just putting a end cap on. I've stopped the sparge on here. So you can see that the grain bed is running dry. Uh, that is because I'm timing the kettle volume filling up at roughly the same time that this is emptying, just so I can conserve as much water as possible. Uh, the pump is still pumping work through the hose into the kettle and the kettle has the burners turned on so that it can continue to heat up. I'm going to collect about 3.5 barrels of wort and I'm almost there. So what I'm gonna do is wait for that to finish up. I'm gonna shut my pump off and then I'm going to take a kettle gravity reading so that I know what my starting kettle gravity is and make sure that we're hitting our target. Okay, so it looks like we are at kettle full. I'm going to go ahead and shut my pump off. I'm going to shut that valve, turn this off. I'm going to turn off the valve to my kettle. I'm going to remove this lid for just a second while I take my gravity sample. Ooh, nice. And I only need a small sample for this gravity reading because I'm not doing a pH reading for the kettle full. I'm going to leave that lid on so that it can retain as much heat as possible. And I'm going to allow this to cool in the uh, reaching cooler since this is significantly warmer than the other sample was. So we'll be back as soon as this comes up to a boil. All right, we're back with the uh, refractometer. All right, that looks like 11.2 to me. That is just a touch lower than I think I'm expecting. But again, we can adjust that by increasing the boil time. So the more water that you boil off on the, uh, during the boil, the more the sugars concentrate as the volume decreases. So I'm gonna check the recipe and see if that's in line with the recipe and uh, compare that to boil off rates and then we'll make a judgment call. Well, it looks like that gravity is, is what we were shooting for. I don't know why I thought it was like 12.1 or something like that, but 11.2 is just shy of 11.4, which is what our target's uh, kettle gravity was. So. We're gonna boil for 90 minutes. I just got done uh, draining the mash tun, so all the liquid has drained out. The grain bed is nice and compact, and I'm going to begin the graining out. I'm gonna take all that grain and put it into bags. Admittedly, this is one of the more janky parts of the process, but hey, I don't have any special uh, shoot for this mash tun, so I have to make do with what I got. So I got some deep hotel pan, and a couple of, uh, well, I have a scooper, just a, a saucepan, and then I've got all of the bags that we had the grain in is what I'm gonna end up putting the, the spin grain into. So normally on a regular brew day, I would fill these bags up, set them outside, and then call a farmer, a rancher, that comes and picks it up and feeds it to his cattle. But seeing how it's uh, getting late and this won't be ready for probably another hour or so until like eight o'clock at night, so I'm just gonna toss it in the trash. So, Anyways, let's get to it. All right, this is the fun part. Whee! So my janky method here is that I fill up this hotel pan with spent grain, and then I kind of maneuver it into one of these grain bags in a very awkward fashion. Like this. <clears throat> Ta-da! Very nice. So I guess the camera's cutting off on me. Um, one thing that I didn't show was that half, at the very end of the sparge, about with a half barrel left that I needed to collect in the kettle, I have switched over to cold water or cool city water to sparge with so that it cooled this down so that it was manageable to work with. Otherwise, this would be like 160 degrees and be pretty, pretty hot. So uh, that's one thing. Uh, I just filled up a bag. I'll show you that again because, again, the camera cut off and I'm just, I guess, I'm going to check it periodically now to make sure that. We are recording, I hope so. Hey, 
And then I fastened the top with a little bit of plastic wrap that's stretched out. It makes a nice little elastic rope. All right, so I'm gonna continue doing this. I'll get it cleaned out and then uh, maybe I'll show spraying it down and stuff like that. All right, let's check it out. We're coming up to a boil right now. Um, this hot break is always, uh, it kind of forms this protein foam cap that will expand and boil over if you don't watch it. So what I do is I generally like to beat it down with the, the paddle as it begins to, to get more of a, a rolling boil. So we're gonna let this continue to raise. This is, remember this thermometer is about two degrees off. So it is at a boil right now, but we're gonna let it get to a real rolling boil and then we'll call the, the time and start our uh, 90 minute timer. And then we'll get our hops weighed out. I know everybody loves seeing hops. All right, so I'm gonna spray all this grain in the back so that I can then take this bucket in this pot and scoop it out with the last little remaining bit. All right, so I'm running Sandy from the bottom of the tank through the pump back through the CIP arm and it is sanitizing the inside of the tank. Once that's done, I'll get the uh, heat exchanger and other parts sanitized. I'm going to finish cleaning up the mash done took a break from that to go get the circuit started so that it can be sanitizing while I'm working. And once this is cleaned up, then I will uh, get hops weighed out because I've got about 15 minutes before I need to add the first, or well, the only addition of hops in this beer. I've got yeast ready. Um, normally I would harvest yeast on a, on a typical brew day, but I've got a fresh pitch of yeast if you wanna see. This is from a company called Propagate Labs. Uh, a pitch for five barrels worth of wort, which I'm brewing three barrels, but it's a lager. So I'm dub basically almost doubling the uh, the pitch rate and it's gonna be uh, an adequate amount of yeast for this. So Saz Hops. So I got these from a company called Hop Havoc. Oh, dope, little gummy bears, I'm gonna Go to town on them. So these are Chexas hops. They are 4.9% alpha acid. I don't know if you can see that. 4.9% alpha acid. Um, this was, a, my recipe calls for 4.5% alpha acid. So I made a quick adjustment from 37 ounces for my 60 minute boil addition to uh, 35 ounces. So not a huge dramatic difference, but it will keep the IBUs at 30 IBUs. And I'm using this official digital thermometer as my knife to open this. And for those that don't know, hops contain a compound called alpha acids. They're boiled, the, the chemical, or I'm sorry, the molecule isomerizes, so it becomes perceivably bitter. And so we utilize that bitterness in beer to balance from the sweetness. So we have our hops. Let me check my timer. Yeah, while I was filming that, the timer went off. So let's take the hops and add them to the boil. All right, boys and girls, here we go. It's the big addition, yay! Hops. All righty, folks, I've got the heat exchanger right here, going through its own sanitation circuit. So pumping from this reservoir of sanitizer through the line, through the pump, and through the heat exchanger ultimately out back into this reservoir. Had the tank sanitized and this uh, sanitizer foamed up just a little bit. So I'm letting that foam dissipate. And then once that's gone, I will close it up and keep it nice and sanitized so that we can go right through our heat exchanger during knockout into a clean sanitized vessel. Got about 25 more minutes on the boil and 10 minutes we will add our 15 minute addition of yeast nutrient and whirl flux. All right, so we've got, as well as the whirl flock and the yeast nutrient, we're also going to add some more salts. So this right here is gypsum, calcium sulfate. We're gonna add 14 grams of this 
Normally when we add salts into the mash, we just assume that those salts carry through into the final wort and then onto the finished beer. But this did not require those salts in the mash for pH adjustment. So we are adding them for flavor and yeast health. We're gonna add 50 grams of calcium chloride. So that'll put us at 64 or 57. So it'll put us at 61. What? I totally, as I was doing that math, I totally spaced. Hold on. Let me recalculate. All right, public math is for the birds. So that uh, was a miscalculation. I only needed to add it up to 72 grams. So I've got this, and then in 15 minutes, we'll add this along with about 12 world flock tabs. Three, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. We are in this phase of just kind of waiting. I've got the circuit for knockout sanitizing right now. The, um, I gotta stop saying, um, the fermentation vessel is sanitized and the boil is about 20 minutes away from being complete. I've got these gummy bears. I'm snacking on. I'm taking a little rest, a little siesta, not siesta, a little sit esta in the beer saloon. And now I'm just gonna wait for about 10 minutes. Then we'll go back there. We'll knock out and hopefully get cleaned up and head home because I'm pretty tired today. So it's about 8.30 right now. I'm staying up here pretty late. So we'll be back. Into the pot they go. Nice. All right, so I guess the microphone cut out on this section. I cut the burner at the end of the boil. This is the whirlpool section. I'm stirring it around with my super fancy whirlpool mechanism. This is my mash paddle, and I'm just going to spin this in a centrifugal fashion so that all of the proteins that coagulated during the boil and hot material kind of collect together in the bottom of the kettle in a nice cone so that we can pull off the clean wort and not have to pull all that crap through our heat exchanger. All right, welcome back to this episode of I Wanna Go Home Soon. Um, it's late and I'm brewing. Uh, it's the first episode in the series. So, tank, sanitized, wort, boiled, whirlpool, rested. Now we need to pump wort through the heat exchanger, clearing all the sanitizer out. And once it clears out, we will connect our sanitized line to this vessel and we will begin the knockout process. This is a pretty hectic process, so I'm probably not gonna talk too much. And if I do, I'm probably gonna stumble over my word. So bear with me. I am gonna take this uh, pretty slow. So, Open. Gotta open the valve to my cold liquor tank. So this vessel over here is a bright tank, but it is it uh, functions as my cold liquor tank. I'm gonna turn this pump on. It's gonna pump water through the heat exchanger. It's gonna come out of this side of the heat exchanger and transfer the heat from the hot work to the uh, water coming out. And I'm gonna turn that down just a bit. And let's turn this pump on. All right, I see it changing color. Uh, allow that to finish pushing out the sandy into that bucket. Close my valve for a hot second. Open that, open my... Oh, I forgot. I had that cooling down. That's a mistake. Don't ever do that, future brewers. I'll explain in just a second. I originally cut this out of the first edit, but figured I would go ahead and do a voiceover explaining what happened for a learning experience. I had closed the blow-off valve to this tank and crashed it. When you crash it, meaning you cool the tank down, the gases and the liquids inside will contract and it will pull a vacuum on the tank. And if you don't have pressure relief valves or vacuum relief valves on the tank, it can implode the tank and basically ruin the tank. So it's 
pretty standard in the industry to never pull from a closed tank, pull liquid out of a closed tank, or crash a tank that is closed uh, without pressure on it. So just a little learning lesson for you in case you didn't know. So now, okay, got that rolling. That water's flowing. Work. So to be flowing. I have to turn this thermometer down this way so that the air pocket in there gets uh, pushed out into the fermentation vessel. Okay, it looks like it's going. Keep it coming. And now that we've got a decent flow. Oh yeah, it's good. See, I don't know if you can see this, but it's kicking out all of the, uh, the air pockets that were in the heat exchanger and blasting it in there. If you can see, take this off of the stand. All right, the shakiness. This is knocking out at around 50. So now we come over to our oxygen tank it's at about three, uh, what is that, liters per minute. And you can see that oxygen is flowing pretty briskly. In fact, I'm gonna turn that down to one and a half because that's pretty aggressive. But let's monitor our temperature. So it's raising in temperature, which means we can do one of two things. We can increase the flow rate of the cold liquor, which we can do over here by opening this up, or we can decrease the flow of the work. So this is moving pretty quickly. It's looking pretty good. And I wanna kinda keep my eye on this to see what it equilibrates out at, because I don't think it'll stay at 60. I think it'll actually continue to grow or, or continue to raise. So uh, any adjustment you make has to, both liquids need to flow through the heat exchanger entirely before you can see the results. So it takes a couple of well, takes several seconds, sometimes minutes, but let's keep an eye on that. And in fact, I'm going to keep this probably right around 60. I'm going to ultimately ferment at 50 degrees, and I have this. Um, oh, why is it set at 55? It should be set at 50 or 60. I don't know why it's at 60. So I'm ultimately going to ferment this at 50 degrees, but Due to the nature of the volume of my cold liquor tank, AKA this bright tank that I use as a cold liquor tank, I am not able to knock out super efficiently right now. So I have to knock out at a higher temperature than I ferment at. And then I'm needing to crash the rest of the way with the glycol system. Hopefully that was a relatively clear explanation of what's happening. This is collecting the hot water and then this is the knockout process so it looks like we've already dropped we would probably send the half barrel through already which is good but you can see this was at three and a half barrels and it's already down to like 2.9 so we are going to end up running out of cold liquor before we get all of this work into the tank which is a bummer it's one of the aspects of this system that i really uh really gives me a lot of stress because the whole, uh, the whole point of lagering is keeping things cold. And when you can't knock out super efficiently, it's, uh, it just makes it a bummer. So uh, I'm going to monitor this, keep the temperature lower than 60, and then finish the knockout. And then we will move on to cleaning. But oh, and then yeast. So I'm letting the yeast warm up and acclimate, but I'm going to let the temperature of the cold or of the uh, temperature of the tank drop to where I, I need it to be before I add the yeast because I don't want to shock it and pitch it at, you know, pitch it at 65 degrees and have it come down to, to 50. So anyways, I will update as soon as something changes. All right. So maybe this is why, uh, maybe this is the value that I can bring as a YouTuber. All right. So you see that? Yeah, it's still riding cool at 60. You see this? 71. And I noticed that this was not condensating, condensing, uh, and it didn't feel very cold. So this thermometer is broken. So that's an inaccurate uh, temperature that is coming out. So I will now disregard those readings 
and I will judge it based on fuel. I will try to send the rest of this wort into, into this tank at a cooler temperature, but that was not a great start to the knockout. So anyways, you live and you learn. All right, we knocked out. We actually didn't run out of cold liquor, which is a very, wow. very big surprise. But then again, we did knock out at 66 degrees, so that makes a little bit of sense. Um, but yeah, so we're done with that. I'm going to take apart all of these hoses. I'm going to start back flushing this heat exchanger because anytime you get any material through the heat exchanger, you want to get that material out, specifically like trubes or trube and hot matter. So back flush that. I've got this hot water sitting in here. I will leave this. Uh, covered, but I'll leave this out to cool down so I don't over tax my uh, glycol system. And then I will begin cleaning this bad boy. So you can see down there, that's the uh, little hop baby. It's uh, the pile of trube and hops down there. And yeah, so I got a bunch of cleaning to do and probably not going to film much of that. But yeah, we knocked out a three barrel batch of 13 degree tamave. I'm going to wait for that to come down to temp and then I'm going to pitch my yeast while everything's cleaning, and then hopefully go home. And that's all, folks. Hood vent, light, got another light. All right, I'm back here in the beer saloon. It's time for a little shifty. So, that was a little brew day action for you. Nazdravi. Yep, so, successful brew day, a couple of hiccups. I forgot to mention, I didn't take a video of it, but the final gravity came in just shy of where I was looking to land. It was about 12.2, 12.3, so it's a little bit low. So I, I will probably need to adjust that recipe for a different boil off rate than what I have in there because I think it's assuming I'm boiling more vigorously and more water is being evaporated and condensing more. So I'll have to adjust that. But other than that, the hot side of the brew day went well. The hiccup during the knockout, the thermometer being broken, that's a bummer, but I do have a backup, so that's good. Filled the fermenter up. It was a little warmer than I expected, so I let it cool down and then pitched yeast and yeah, that went smoothly, cleaned everything up, put everything back. And now I am sitting here. I don't know if you can uh, tell, but I'm soaked. That is the aftermath of a uh, legs on the ground, getting splashed on all brew day. So, but I'm just enjoying this beer now. This is a 12 degree pale lager. Uh, yeah, it's like 10.20 at night right now. I'm going to finish this and then head back to the house, take a shower, and then get up tomorrow and, and do some other beer work. So I hope that you enjoyed this. Yeah, a few people were asking in the comments on, on other videos. So this is a day in the brewery here at Tanglefoot Brewing. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed it and wait, can't wait to get back to it and do another video covering some other part of the process. Cheers. Nazdravi. Have a good night.